Sí, sí, uno, sí, bueno, uno, dos, tres. Ya no sé. Okay. Okay. Uh, we are going to start with the. Please, um, quiet. We are going to start with the, um, this uh, exercise that we have uh, been performing for some years, and I think it's very useful. So remember, guys, you have all of you have five minutes to explain briefly your project. Um, Professor Maya Kerman uh, will give you another five minutes of feedback. Yep. So, good luck. <laughs> well, good afternoon. Um, our project is about how to improve a community strategies that seek to revitalize an indigenous language, the Mazatec language case. Um, I'm going to talk about the general aspects of indigenous languages in Mexico. In Mexico, there are 11 linguistic families that gather 68 linguistic groups with 364 linguistic variations. These languages are facing a gradual displacement in communities that are starting urbanization processes, where the official language becomes the main interaction medium. We decided to focus in the Mazatec region in Oaxaca, in a specific Huautla de Jiménez, a zone facing urbanization process. Huautla is the yellow point at the map. And there the use of the language has been gradually displaced from quotidian use. For example, commercial transaction, governmental functions, education, and health service. This plate phenomenon is, represent, is represented in graphic, in this part. And many are the factors identified in this phenomenon, but also there is a wide variety of strategies developed by members of the community to prevent the loss of Mazateca language. Okay, in our first visit to the Mazatec community, we found a ritual called Uwentones. We wanted to find an element that represents the Mazatec culture that we can work with, and that was the ritual. Also, everyone uh, said to us, you should work with the Uwentones ritual. Uwentones are boys and young, young men uh, using customs who go from house to house singing and dancing in their own uh, language, uh, their, uh, their own music. This ritual is an element uh, which is part of the celebration of the Day of the Dead, which is a festival that take, takes place from October 27 to November the 2nd. In the recent years, there have been an increasing number of Wawentones music groups. This is important because all the music from Wawentones practice is in Mazatec, and it becomes uh, a, a way to learn teach, or, or teach Mazatec language to kids or everyone who find interest in this practice. 
So between these days, everyone listened to Wawantone's music in Mazatec, in houses, food stands, schools, public transport, radio stations, everywhere. Uh, and also it represents a very important element from the identity of the Mazatecan. So we found this practice very important and interesting to work with. Uh, until 10 years ago, uh, the Wawantones festivity was, had almost disappeared, and there were efforts by people from the community to recover it. Uh, some of these efforts um, was one of the main musical groups started to add rhythms that weren't part of the Wawantones uh, traditional music. And rhythms such as uh, cumbia or, or popular music. And also other thing that allowed it to, to recover was that it started to be recorded on, on devices were like cassettes first and then DVDs. And this caused the young people to be more interested and comprised into this festivity and start to participate. And uh, also what the, these devices caused was the increase of linguistic circulation and it allowed to free the, the production of music from the festivity uh, temporality. So the music is produced not only uh, as a product to be sold, also it has a symbolic meaning in which one can find identity elements in the discourses of the songs. And our aim is to focus on the sound aspect of the festivity, on the orality, on the music, and on the songs. And to develop a methodology to apply with communities that lack of written systems to boost orality and language socialization. Thanks. So actually, the last part that, that you were talking about, uh, could you clarify a little bit the devices that were being used? What exactly did those devices do? Well, uh, at the beginning, they only had the production of music on the festivity temporality. And they produced the music to be sung during the festivity. And this oh. group that started to add the, the different rhythms, they started to record their, their own music on cassettes and, and then later on DVDs and DVDs and this allowed it to, to the people to listen to the music uh, outside the festivity. So it was a, a medium so that the, the language could be uh, and the music could be heard outside the, the temporality. And, and how do you currently plan to, thanks for, for the clarification, how do you currently plan to address these challenges? Uh, we still are thinking on how we will uh, work with the, with the song. We, we have uh, two, two main options right now. Mm -hmm. One is uh, a platform on, on internet. It's, it's mm -hmm. uh, like a first idea on platform where the people from the community that lives in Huautla and the people that lives outside because there is a lot of migration and they still come back during this festivity to Huautla to, to leave the festivity because it's uh, seven days during the, the dead, dead days. And so that they can produce, if they produce music, they can produce it and uh, upload it to this uh, platform to share it okay. with the members of the community. So, okay, let me just recap to make sure that I understand before I give you advice. Uh, so the challenge is uh, an attempt to revive um, an original language uh, of a people. Uh, there is interest in the community to revive the language, yeah. and the question is then how can you guys be helpful in that process, help move the process along, right? Uh, and uh, in addition to it, I'm understanding that traditionally the music, which is really the best way to preserve the language, only happens during uh, holiday seasons, and that's not enough to preserve a language. And so they started recording the music, 
And that's kind of, it, it's really, it reminds me of tracing uh, the way that technology helped the yeah. rest of the world. I mean, we started by recording music and then gradually started getting technology involved in more ways. Okay, I think I have a good enough understanding to, to make some meaningful comments. Um, so uh, one thing that comes to mind almost immediately, um, and perhaps you can comment on whether that's true, is that usually the older generation are very uh, excited to preserve the language, but sometimes it's a little bit more challenging to get the young people involved. Does that tend to agree with your understanding of the situation? Yeah, it's what, what is happening there. Okay, okay, well that's, it's very, I think it's universal, right? The, old, the older people want to keep the beauty of things that are you know, kind of phasing out. Um, and so one, um, it reminded me of a paper actually that I just reviewed where somebody came in with a co-creative composer into a community and had, uh, they had a different computer system. It was actually done somewhere in Japan or China. Uh, and they had the whole community involved in creating a new song in a style of, of traditional music. And that was kind of an, a, a nice way to revive some of that old culture. So it, it just immediately pops to mind that perhaps engaging the young people by having them create music whether it's through an Alicia-like system or a system that helps just come up with the melodies or, I mean, there's a whole bunch of fairly simple things that can be done. For example, you could um, take the traditional music and feed it into a Markov chain, which is a very, very simple model that you could create. Are any of you engineers, computer scientists of the three of you? No, there is uh, another partner that is not here right now, but she's a... Uh yeah, computer scientists. Okay, programmer. perfect. I mean, this, this is not difficult to do. Markov chains are one of the simplest things to learn. And if you guys could feed in some music in that traditional music of these people, um, then it could give you new melodies, just melodies with no words, that uh, kind of have the same feel. So that could make it exciting for the young people to engage in creating a new song because it's using technology and young people tend to like using technology. But then again, it's, it's tying back to the musical style and they could then embed words that are part of that language into that. So that was uh, sort of my main suggestion. And another, uh, another direction in which I thought is uh, because already music is the main, um, the main way that the, uh, the language is being preserved, it may be possible to start uh, in increasing this by increasing the kind of art forms. So for example, going from music to something similar to a musical, I mean, of course it has to be culturally appropriate, but something that perhaps builds a little bit more of a story with the music. I don't know if that's already happening. And then kind of moving from music to drama uh, to help expand the type of art forms that preserve the music. And then of course, if you can have uh, maybe skits or movies so that there's again a digital component, again, there might be more excitement from the young people um, in this domain. I hope this is helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>Hi. Thank you, Maya, to be here. Uh, our uh, team is working about sexual harassment. We have a little video uh, to introduce the topic in the university, uh, please. Como bloque de alumnos, proponemos la inclusión del punto 3, análisis, discusión y aprobación en su caso, de la integración de una comisión encargada de crear un código de ética y un protocolo ante acoso en la Huanco, Ajimalpa.
Okay, uh, this is a serious problem and we want to work about this. Um, but what's sexual harassment? Sexual harassment, according to the United States, it's any non-consensual uh, behavior uh, and it can be a, a, uh, such not soliciting uh, touching or maybe comments. Okay. Uh, in Mexico, we have uh, two, two types of, of harassment, horizontal and vertical. Horizontal, in Mexico, we call uh, acoso, and vertical, we call hostigamiento. What's the main feature of any of that? Uh, horizontal, it, it uh, happens between peers or strangers. In vertical, it happens between uh, a power relationship. It can be a teacher with uh, his or her student, or maybe in a job. Uh, our problem statement is the university community lacks information to prevent cases of sexual harassment, specifically, specifically in the in Wamse. And we make uh, a we we did a little um, uh, survey. survey, sorry, a little survey in in the university to know how the the students live the, the sexual harassment, and the women say. 30% uh, of the women we, we survey uh, say the aggressor was a student and, and followed by a, a, a teacher. Uh, the men say uh, only 12% said yes, but all, uh, uh, all the aggressor f was a student. And we uh, ask about if you can harass someone. 20% uh, uh, of the women say I'm not sure. And 21% of the of the men say not sure too. And we ask about if you are, have any, any information about this, this situation. And 79% of the of the in, in people say yes. But in case they have a, a sexual harassment, they not sure they not sure how to act. We don't know how this information maybe is not useful, and we want to make useful information for, for this kind of people. So our research question is how sexual harassment can be prepared, prevent at the university, at, at here. So our objectives are advice, educate, and insights. Specifically, uh, propose a, str a strategy to influence in the behavior of the students, generate an information system uh, to recognize uh, sexual harassment and create a proposal to allow the user to appropriate this information. So our uh, strongest uh, proposal is not the final, is uh, uh, we give it to you to give some feedback, is to make a web doc or interactive uh, in documentary that have, uh, it will have a strong narrative, uh, we'll, we will want, uh, want to have to some storytelling from some victims, uh, make some infographics, and maybe we can, uh, with this tool, gather some information uh, about this, this situation in the university. And, uh, well, this is all uh, for five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's a really important big problem that you're tackling. So uh, I really commend you for tackling such such a big issue. Wow, I'm I'm very impressed. Uh, have you guys heard of the Me Too hashtag? Uh, my friends, yeah, they started posting this just on Facebook. A few of my friends just posted hashtag Me Too, and I got curious this morning. So before coming here, I quickly Googled what that means, and it's. It's this very, very recent, a few, I think it's a few days ago, it's most a few weeks ago, that women started posting Me Too, basically to indicate that they too have experienced sexual harassment. Um, and it's really um, it's an extremely difficult topic because it's, it's heavily underreported. Um, the victim often is not sure if it really happened, if it was their fault, a lot of, a lot of self-blame. Uh, and so I believe that the great majority of cases go unreported. And I think that's part of what you guys are, are trying to challenge. I really like the idea of putting together a movie and infographics to help, uh, to help communicate the importance of this and perhaps uh, how, um, what the victims can do, right? And um, one thing actually that came up 
and um, I just started a new position at, at uh, Santa Clara University. And during orientation, they want to make sure that the professors know how to handle uh, stuff like that. And one thing that came up is also the importance of protecting um, people who are being accused of sexual harassment, right? So it, it kind of goes hand in hand uh, to, make sh to make sure that, you know, both the accused and accuser um, are being treated fairly, right? So, so in a way that I think that'd be nice if you would consider including maybe a case in the documentary of a guy, I mean, it, that's unfortunately usually, usually the direction, but somebody who was blamed of it but really was innocent uh, and how that's also a problem just you know to, to cover to cover those cases um, as, as you were and, and by the way I would love to see it afterwards so please please share the, the material with me if you can I'd be very curious how to, how to tackle this a another thing that came up to my mind while you were talking um, is perhaps if there is some way maybe through a website or some other accessible medium through which uh, men and women who experience sexual harassment could share what happened to them completely confidentially, and get some sort of feedback. First of all, is this really harassment? And second of all, what can you do about it? Uh, because when I think back to problems that I'm aware of and problems that some of my friends experienced, it's such a gray area because there are so many forms of behavior and so forms of interaction that couldn't fall under this, um, especially in vertical, vertical sexual harassment that a person can find themselves um, really lost, you know, find themselves perhaps trying to make difficult decisions between reporting, but then they think if they report, maybe they're going to lose out in some other way. Uh, so confidential advice could be very, very helpful, especially if it's something that is also promoted. So people on campus know that they have this confidential advice available to them in a very safe environment. Perhaps online would actually be a good medium because I think people feel more confidential in that, in that form. So yeah, those are my ideas. Thank you. Okay. Hello. <laughs> we are Rodrigo, Ana, and Ariela, and our project is the creation of a transportation system for and between universities of the west side of Mexico City. Okay. Um, to introduce uh, to introduce you how Mexico City works, um, Mexico is one of the cities with more transit in the world. The travel time is 66% more, which means 59 extra minutes per day. Also, the public transportation is not enough for everyone in the city. Uh, Santa Fe is the business center located at the west of the city. Most of the people just came here to work or to study. They don't live here because of the high rental prices. And here are four very important uh, universities. Uh, the access roads uh, to the area are limited and the transportation time sometimes is double or even triple. So the first map is Me Mexico City in the rush hour, and the left is uh, Toluca, a very important city too. The second map shows uh, Santa Fe in rush hour, and the third one shows how far the uh, metro system is from our university. The key point is our university. Okay, uh, our building is in Santa Fe, located here in Santa Fe, and the, our institution is uh, isolated within the same area. Uh, we don't have uh, enough uh, 
transportation for to connect with the rest of the area. Uh, even uh, the distance, it's not a problem. We don't have enough ways to connect with uh, the rest of Santa Fe or even the the city. We have just one uh, internal transportation system, but, but it's not enough to cover the demands of the community. Okay, so we found a very important problem that also affects us as students with mobility. Uh, it takes a lot of time to reach here. It's insecure, it's inefficient, it's uncertain, and has little options. This is not the only problem. This generates a lot of problems, like few participation in extrascolar activities, the non-attachment feeling, unpunctuality, absence to classes, desertion, and this does not allow the university to increase the number of students. Here the students doesn't feel like this is their campus, they just come here to study and they have a lot of travel to reach, so they want to leave as soon as possible before the rush hour or whatever. Our general objective is to improve the mobility for the students, for the university students in the west side of Mexico. And our proposal is we want to generate an interconnected system between the universities of the west side, which are Iberoamericana, Tech, CIDE, and WAM. Uh, with this system, students can transport easily inside Santa Fe and reach and leave their universities and home. Also, they, they are going to have access to activities and develop a community of students of Santa Fe, interchanging resources of every university. We imagine this is a kind of campus where students don't just come to study and live, but they also can be here to do other activities and feel part of a community. We learned that m mobility is difficult to solve by itself, and we, just, we want to attack uh, not just the problem by itself, but also intervening in other aspects that can help. For example, distributing schedules or something. The first part of our uh, proposal is to create an internal transportation in Santa Fe for the students between the four uh, universities I told before. And we will we'll choose another key points, for example, Mall Santa Fe, which is a very important point for mobility. And Samara is an important point for, um, for entertainment. So we want to know which is the necessity of each university and create the best routes. And outside Santa Fe, we will, after learning and analyzing the places where most students come from, we lay out the more convenient routes uh, to reach and leave the university. We localize the nine important journeys that will come at least four times a day in the more, most needed hours of the students. And the whole system will be supported by a digital platform where uh, the students can check the buses, the, the real-time capacity and where there are two. And plus where they can check uh, some cultural schedule about the activities and entertainment in other uh, universities in the area where they can access to by being part of this community in the system. Yeah, having like a digital identification or something so they can go to the university or the transport. So like a community of all students. Not, I'm not, here we go. That's really nice. Again, another very real issue that students are facing and you guys are tackling it. That's just wonderful. Um, so as I said, one, one clarification. So in the transport, transportation system that you're imagining, is it buses or cars? What's the actual? Well, we, we imagine buses because now, nowadays we have some buses and also the other universities have buses that we can provide and like make this interchange of resources we all have so yes we imagine buses well that's great I mean first of all that's excellent it can have a lot of impact what you're proposing I really like it a lot and and definitely having um, 
kind of a nice app that goes along with it, maybe one that like Uber shows you where the bus is, that makes people feel more comfortable, more like they know what's happening. Um, I already turned, I should be careful not to touch it. Okay. So um, a few other ideas popped to mind as you guys were talking about it. So one is kind of building up on the Uber model, and the other one is building up on the Google model. So I live in Silicon Valley, and these companies are all right there, so I know a little bit too much about them. <laughs> um, so let's start with the Uber model, because that's a little bit more of a, I guess, familiar concept. Um, so um, something that I believe some universities try to do is to set up a convenient carpool among its students. And the nice thing about this is it doesn't conflict with having a better public transportation system. It just gives students more options. Um, and there are many advantages if you travel together. Um, and you know, it's shared, uh, shared cost for gas, uh, and uh, some of the convenience that comes with the flexibility of, of, of ride sharing. Um, so that, that's another thing you might want to consider, setting up some sort of an app that makes it easy for students uh, to carpool. I mean, ideally in real time, the way that Uber does. And so that would, could, could be one direction to try. Um, then the other direction is sort of going in a completely different angle. Um, I've been writing down some of the challenges that you guys are facing as a result of uh, all these traffic issues. And I don't, I don't actually think it's, it's possible to solve all of them. Uh, so it's nice to have a mixture of solutions that solve different parts. So the Google model, <laughs> and the, what, what I'm calling the Google model, is to make um, things on campus that make it so convenient and comfortable so that students might choose to stay here later and you know, wait for the next traffic time when traffic calms down, which is much later, giving them the possibility to engage more in, in, in campus activities. So um, for example, one thing that Google does, and again, I, I'm not familiar enough with the campus to know what are areas of improvement, um, but Google, for example, provides abundant food. You know, so that, that's one big thing. There's a nice gym. I'm, I'm assuming the university has some of those, but some of the more unique ways in which Google makes it easy for its employees to hang around and not view it as a commuter campus. Google campus is definitely not a commuter campus, um, is they have these really cool Google beds. They're pretty small, um, and you can take a nap. They're not meant for overnight sleeping, and that's, I'm not trying to promote that. But, but sometimes people want to go home because they want a little bit of a break, and then by the time they get home in this kind of traffic, they don't want to come back for activities. But maybe if there was some more convenient way for them to just lie down and uh, disconnect for a little while, Maybe that would solve some of the other problems that are harder to solve by introducing a, a transportation, by improving the tra transportation system. So I really think it's, it's a matter of coming up with solutions that address the different issues, uh, perhaps in, in complementary ways. Uh, great project. Yeah. Hi, <laughs> how are you? Good. Thank you for coming. My name is Tania, uh, she's Jocelyn, and he's Sergio. And we are going to present our project that calls Model of Interactions in a Literature Reader's Community. Um, I'm going to give you a little background and a little bit fast because we only have five minutes. <laughs> uh, here in Mexico City, there is no uh, significant investment to preserve the communities of readers. There is no record of the communities of readers and there is actually no study of them. So it seems like the communities are just is isolated or in, improvised efforts. They last just a little bit of time. So we ask ourselves, uh, what's, what's the purpose of the readers' community of if they are important? And the answer is, of course, it's, it's, it's important, yes. Um, because the in the community, people can share interpretations of reading. Uh, they can create senses. They can uh, exchange visions and points. Uh, and the community can uh, strengthen the habit of reading. So that's why 
We want to study the possible and real interactions among the members of the readers' community. We focus on the communities in Mexico City whose activities are based on the reading of fiction and non-fiction literature, and we discuss those that have academics or, or scientific or didactic text. And so our main objective is to shape a theoretical model of the interactions within a community of fiction and non-fiction literature readers that helps to represent the social phenomenon reduce its complexity and facilitate the, the, the study of such communities in Mexico City. So to, to answer, uh, this is the, the question we want to, to answer. What are the characteristics of a model that represents the elements and processes of the interaction in a fiction and non-fiction literature readers community in Mexico City? In order to achieve our main objective, we also have a secondary objective that we can uh, understand as, as a research route. And in this time, we, we are in the first uh, secondary objective, which is define the elements and the process that take place in the interaction of a community to build a model. In order to achieve this, in, we are uh, working on an interdisciplinary theoretical framework focused on the interactive concept. Uh, the second uh, um, objective in this line is design a graphic represent representation of the model to understand the theoretical reflection. Uh, to study uh, fictional and non-fictional literary readers' communities based in the theoretical model to identify, identify successful activities and how to duplicate them, and uh, even improve it. Uh, to apply this knowledge, uh, we, we think that we can implement a playful artifact in our university in order to, think, uh, to make a community readers here in, in one. Uh, why, why we think here is a, a good place to, to do things. According to statistics uh, made by the government of the, the city, uh, the population of the Iguam Cuajimalpa has the educational level and is the age of the, the age range of the people most likely to read the, for pleasure. Has a library available and there are no communities of readers and being educational institution. We are working on some ideas to, to make this real. The main idea bef uh, behind all of these ideas is think how to use the space where the students already interact, that is the physical space of the university, to promote reading interactions. And that's all for now. This is very interesting, a very kind of creative choice of project. I love it. Um, so uh, let, let me just make, make sure that I completely understand uh, again. Mm. Okay, so basically you want to understand reading communities, which would be like book clubs. Is that a good, is that a good synonym for reading community? Like people get together, they all read the book at home, let's say, and then they come together and discuss it. That's the kind of communities, no? Yes, yes, yeah. that's a kind of communities that we are studying actually. Okay, perfect. Um, and I assume there is quite a few of them throughout the city, and they can be kind of self-formed and perhaps difficult to track uh, because of that. Okay, very interesting. Um, and so what's your, your goals now? So I think I understand the, the setting. But the goals seem to be to first to represent, to, to gain an understanding and represent it in some kind of useful way. And then what's, uh, is there like a secondary goal then? Can you, can you help fill it in, please? Yeah, the, the, our main objective first I'd like to model these interactions uh -huh. exactly like by studying them, as you said, uh, in, the, in the city. Uh -huh. But our second um, objective, it would be like to make a readers community here at WAM with the students. So the, the project we are going to be like implementing here 
so the goal is to understand reading communities in general, but then create reading communities within the university. Yeah, okay. Uh, and are there any reading communities in the universities right now? No, not really. Like, okay. like as Tania said, they, there are like some projects, but they are they seem like improvised, so they are not like formally conformed. <laughs> Uh, so you want to make a better structure for yes, that? Yes, so, so that's why we are choosing this, this gender of literature, like uh, the one that ev evokes imagination. Mm -hmm. So we are like discarding all, all the literature that is about academic stuff or ped pedagogic. pedagogic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Okay, okay, great. I mean, I, th I, think, I, I think I understand enough. Um, so if you're trying to build a model that represents something in the real world, where you typically start is you collect data, right? Um, so just so I don't tell you a whole bunch of stuff that you already know, did you guys already start getting some data? That's, that's kind of the part that we are now. You're in right now, okay. You were in the research. Part. So um, a nice place to start might be the library itself. Um, First of all, they have a lot of information about what people are reading, uh, the kind of books, the kind of subjects that people are most interested in. So that could help you figure out what kind of uh, book communities, what kind of books those communities might be reading. There might be a little bit of co correlation between popular genres and what people want to discuss. Um, they might also, um, it's a bit of a guess, also have some idea about reading communities. Uh, libraries have kind of evolved from being places to store books uh, to entities that do try to have roots in the community. So it's conceivable that they could give you some leads uh, to people you could talk to to start understanding the way that these communities operate around here. Um, yeah, I think, I think that would be kind of the best way to perhaps start um, figuring out what the network of readers might look like. Um, and then, of course, a lot of what you decide to do will depend on what you discover in this phase. Um, but it seems to me that later on down the line, when you want to create new readers community, it, it, it makes sense to leverage the convenience of uh, having part of the interaction online. Perhaps the group formation can happen through an app or a website. And then later on, people could engage um, in person, could, could arrange some. Uh, there are some examples of very successful online communities. Um, perhaps you remember the name escapes me right now. Uh, okay, yeah, Goodreads, exactly, that's it. Um, so for a local version of a kind of a light version of this type of thing uh, could be very helpful. And of course, the kind of model that you build to understand how people tend to group around reading here could help you design the online platform in a way that would facilitate that. Um, I think uh, that's, I mean, another quick thing that kind of comes to mind when you were talking about the model here is uh, perhaps some game theoretic models could, could help, uh, could be helpful in, uh, in interpreting that. Um, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of work in game theory. It's sort of the goal almost of the, of the research area is to come up with models that are simple and yet represent uh, the real world. So for example, a friend of mine right now um, she came up with a model that does a pretty good job representing a capitalist uh, money flow. Right? So it's simple, you can mathematically prove stuff about it, but yet it represents the real world. Uh, so I think that there is opportunity for some game theoretic modeling uh, with the way that people tend to interact about reading. Or even, um, well now, now I have more ideas, right? <laughs> even if you get a whole bunch of people who do engage in these type of clubs, it might be interesting to, to look at overlap. Like if you cluster the data, you could look at um, whether people tend to stick within one genre and only want to, do, to have a book club around one genre, or if there tends to be more complex interaction where the same person would be perhaps part of three book clubs. Um, so you know, applying some kind of data analysis such as you know, cluster analysis could be an easy place to start to understand the data. Um, that could give you further insight on, into what's happening. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.
Hi, welcome here. So um, we are uh, from the communication line. Uh, Fabian, I am uh, from Interaction System. And I'm Erne Valmori, uh, I am graphic designer. And I am uh, Leticia Luna from, uh, I am system engineer. So, um, we have a proposal of a digital platform for the dissemination of historical knowledge. And uh, we are focused uh, on the knowledge about the conventual life of the discalced Carmelitas who inhabited a former convent uh, called uh, here in the Desierto de los Leones. That is a place uh, not far away from here. So. No. As I say, we want uh, to propose a digital platform for the dissemination of this historical uh, knowledge, and we want to generate with that an enduring experience uh, in the users. So that's our goal. <laughs> Why? Well, um, there is not too much uh, awareness in um, the inhabitant here in these surroundings about that. And I, we think that is a part of our cultural heritage and also um, the relationships that the, these monks had when he came to this part to found that convent has still consequence in these uh, communities. So uh, another thing is that we want to um, use this knowledge about uh, this order as a getaway to the historical context of the new Spain, also here in Mexico. And uh, we also know that uh, there is a shortage of digital proposals for the dissemination, so focused on the dissemination of historical knowledge. How? So we want uh, to create, uh, one of our options is to create a hypermedia narrative uh, to uh, generate a personal response. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it could be awareness, enjoyment, or interest. Uh, we want to uh, do that through um, a series of resources like auditory, visual, or digital resources. So another option is to create an app or to design and create an app uh, that uh, permit uh, trans the trans transmission of the knowledge of these uh, monks when the visitor enters the convent. So, and also um, it could be, uh, so we think that there, are, there will be also stations where the visitor can stop and experience with her sense, uh, their sense, uh, some events that uh, occurs to the Carmelites there. Um, yeah. Can be accessed and at any time or place, uh, so it's not uh, required. The, the user can uh, download the, the application uh, before he visits the convent, and it's not the uh, internet connection required. <coughs> um, we will work uh, in a group of people, the, of users, uh, ages, and ages, um, ages uh, range between 25 or, or 35 years. Uh, we chose the, this range of, of people, of people uh, because um, uh, they're, they're the most visitors of the of the convent, and we will we'll focus only on those who have experience in, in the use of technology. Thank you. This is a, another fascinating question. I'm re I'm really uh, really amazed at the amazing projects that you're that you're tackling here it's 
really very impressive. Um, actually, I got to learn a little bit about Mexico's history. Uh, yesterday, Rafael took me around the city and told me a lot about uh, how Mexico came to be and some of the important monuments, and it was, it was fascinating. Uh, so I'm really happy to hear that you're thinking of ways to preserve this amazing history. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually um, really agree very strongly about the importance of doing it. Uh, my grandfather um, is a Holocaust survivor. He was a child in Poland when the Nazis came in and he was put in a ghetto, his whole family was killed. So um, it's actually this, this idea of preserving history is something I've been involved with for quite a long time. Um, when I was in Florida, I was involved with the Holocaust um, preservation communities there. Um, and we were looking at actually doing something similar, but a little bit different. We were looking at building a monument together with an app. Um, and around that time, um, a, a little bit later, uh, we actually found out that uh, in Miami, there is a, an amazing Holocaust uh, museum. And with it, there is there's an app. Actually, so, sorry, it's, it's a monument. So there, is, there are museums, but there is also a monument that comes with a really uh, extensive app. And uh, I played with the app, and, it, and it's really amazing. So part of it was um, talking about the Holocaust, kind of sharing the stories of Holocaust survivors, sort of in uh, little bites of short stories. It, it, it ultimately tells a very long story, but it's in little pieces, which is a little bit more suitable to today's attention span and the kind of patience people have with electronics. Uh, so it was really, really well done, an excellent documentary built in mm -hmm. in this form. And then another part of the app was specifically for people who are visiting uh, the monument. Uh, so immediately when you said that you want to tie the app to physical um, locations, uh, there's a lot of them here in, in Mexico City and, and around the area, um, I thought that would be nice to do, maybe to have a part in there that can be done from anywhere because it's more of a beautiful history lesson. Um, and then another part that's connected to the monuments. And then I started thinking, how would you make sure that they're getting the right information? Um, so when we, were, when we were thinking about it back then with the Holocaust monument, we thought about using these little codes that nowadays um, phones can scan. But the challenge with that, I would guess, is that it would be very hard to convince anybody to put codes on these beautiful ancient buildings. So that's probably not a good idea. Uh, but there has been a lot of progress um, in um, computer vision. And nowadays, uh, even on the, on the new Apple phone, uh, you can show it a picture and it will be able to tell where you're at. Uh, so perhaps you could do this kind of geographical locationing directly from the camera's phone. Have the user give you permission to use their camera and then uh, use some of the, rely heavily on some of this existing technology to figure out where they are so you can give them the right information. Mm -hmm. And the easier you make it for the user, the more likely they are to actually mm -hmm. gain that information. And the final idea, um, you were talking about having an immersive experience, which I think is just so fabulous. But of course, with an app, we have limited abilities because it only accesses only certain senses, right? You can see something, you can hear something, and that's more or less it. Um, and perhaps you already thought about it, but one thing that popped to my mind was because there is the musical history of, mm -hmm. of this region is just so rich. Mm -hmm. It'd be really nice uh, to have some correlation between perhaps the music that they hear while they're visiting certain sites mm -hmm. uh, that are related to that time in history. Yeah, so these are, these are my suggestions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank Hi, thanks for coming. Well, my name is Patricia, Sister, Elena, and Mariana. And well, our project is named Towards an Information System for Decision Making on Urban Solid Waste Management. Well, 
But what is solid, urban solid waste? Well, um, the urban solid waste are those materials that are generated in our houses, those materials that are used, are used in domestic activities, and also not just the products, even their, their containers of that, of that product. So these uh, materials are in a, in a management, in a management process. But what is it? What is a urban solid waste management? Uh, well, management is an interrelated uh, set of normative actions uh, for the management of solid waste from generation pro to final disposal. In Mexico, management consists of four general uh, stages. The first one is generation, then collection, transfer, and final disposal. Well, uh, solid waste in numbers. In the world, uh, we generate about 10 billion tons annually. In Mexico, we generate about uh, 42 million tons annually. Uh, but while talking about management services, 99% uh, of municipalities have uh, access to collection services, but only 22% uh, to final uh, disposal size services. Uh, this refers to a deficiency in the management process between uh, collection and final disposal. Okay. Uh, in Mexico and the world, an inadequate management of the solid urban waste generates or affects our, sorry, <laughs> our health and our environment. In order or that, several uh, international organizations strongly recommend uh, generate, uh, create, and design data or data in order to make uh, better decisions in the process of the urban waste management. Okay, but there is a big problem that information that data is not linked, and that is we want to focus on. So the problem that we sorry. So the problem that we are facing uh, refers to, that, to a big bunch of not linked information. But why is it so important to have linked information? We think, and, we have, and the state of art of, of solid waste management, uh, tell us that a, a better linked information allows us to make a, a better decision process. So our general objective is design a linked information system that support the decision making with the solid urban waste management. And we can reach this objective with other three particular objectives. The first one is analyze the urban solid waste process and the elements that, it, that are involved on, them, on it. Uh, to model uh, an information system the, um, through the uh, pre-processing of data and make a visualization that can help to the decision making. And finally, uh, test the, um, the system. But uh, how uh, to, uh, to achieve this? Well, uh, we can do it by the um, uh, integration uh, by, uh, uh, of three fields of knowledge. This is computing, information design, and communication strategies. Okay. Right now, we are identifying the different uh, governmental institutions that, that are uh, producing that data in Mexico. And um, we are collecting that databases, and right now we are getting involved with the data. This, uh, and by now, that's it. Yeah. That's all. Uh, you have any question? <laughs> by now, that's all. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's great. Um, wow, that's a really really important issue. You know, it's amazing the role that data plays in the world, right? Yeah. Like, if we could link the data, it could lead to much better decision making, right? And that's and that's very true. Um, what did we do before? Data was a big thing. <laughs> um, great. Um,
So, I mean, first of all, it's a really kind of fascinating, challenging um, project. And, and it's really nice that you're already thinking about kind of how to represent and disseminate the information, um, which, which is great. Um, so one question I had is, uh, so is the goal to collect kind of static data to find out what all the data that we have right now um, and then represent it and make it all available? Or is the goal for kind of a more dynamic system where you could continue to collect the data and continue to update the current state? So w which direction were you, and both are valuable, but which way? We haven't not decided yet, but both are really interesting goals. So by now, uh, we found out uh, an indicators, right? Mm -hmm. Designed by specialists in solid waste management and indicators, statics, all the stuff. And we want to, um, we are, okay, exploring that uh, indicators and we are proving that really work. I mean, with the real data from the institutions. And it depends the kind of data that we found, find the next definition for this system, right? That's the thing. <laughs> That's right, and that makes a lot of sense. In reality, um, there's a lot of pressure sometimes to define the entire research project before you've started. But the truth is that the research project or, you know, evolves as it happens. And so it's true, until you have some understanding of the kind of data you're looking at, it's hard to pre-plan everything. So, yeah. so I'm, I'm completely with you on that. Uh, but I'm just wondering, do you have some idea about the volumes of data we're looking at? Like, is this, or is this too early to know? I think it's a little bit early to know. Mm, we have found, uh, I don't know the name in English, census. Mm -hmm. Um, international territory about solid waste um, by now. Um, but some of that databases are lost. Lost. Okay. Oh, we are missing looking data. for that. Uh -huh. Yeah. So we are um, contact different uh, government, governmental institutions, you know, getting yeah. in touch to ask for it. Up for them. Yeah, okay. we are in that You're in that phase. phase. Yeah. And, and that's fascinating. I mean, I anticipate that as you guys start getting data, um, what might happen is that the data might be represented differently by, so one plant or one organization has one representation for the data focusing on certain aspects of, you know, of this task and another, another organization represents everything very, very differently. So I anticipate that one of the main challenges here would be to find a uniform representation so you could capture everything. And that's, that's really, um, it's really kind of a beautiful challenge. Um, it's, it takes a lot of creativity. And uh, so don't, don't hesitate to pause and really think about how to represent the information in a uniform way that's going to be uh, extendable and it's going to be good for a long time. Because then if you need to go back and change the representation, it can actually be harder. You might have to undo a lot of the future work. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one thing. And then if you do end up with a lot of data, another thing that nice representation helps with, it, it helps with later with data analysis. So if you, if you do end up down the line with volumes of data, you could apply some machine learning on it to help, to help yeah. understand it further, to help to find patterns. Uh -huh. Yeah, and then also help make good predictions. Uh, I don't yeah. understand the space <laughs> enough to know the kind of things you might be trying to learn, but you could kind of formalize it and have the machine give you suggestions on how you should be proceeding further. Um, another thing that you might want to have a look at uh, after you have some data and a little bit more of a footing with this project, uh, net network, network flow theory uh, is all about um, often applied in traffic analysis. Uh, but this is similar here, right? We're sort of transferring waste, large, large quantities of waste, and we have certain uh, objectives, right? So certain parameters we might want to optimize. Um, so you, thinking about it, kind of looking a little bit into the network, network flow literature could help you come up with, or even perhaps lean on other people's findings that could be applied well to your problem to help figure out solutions once you are at, at that phase. And it can actually, network flow might help you with modeling a little bit as well. Because that's, um, it's, it can be thought of as, a, it relies at least on graph theory. So you, you kind of represent uh, 
represent the problem as a graph, and then you have edges through which information flows. Uh, so that does seem to me on some level appropriate for you know, moving waste from different positions. Okay. Um, so, so, so it okay. might be helpful. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that's it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much for your feedback. <laughs> Thank you, Maya. I don't know if we, if we told you that our master is composed by three domains fields. So our students in their project, uh, they are from computer science, design, and communication science. So they are starting. This is the, the final project. It's their second year. But it's at the stage of uh, thinking about how it's going to work or what are they going to do. So your feedback is very important at this stage of the, um, uh, of the process. Thank you very much. I don't know if anyone has any question for Maya. No? Okay, thank you very much. Thanks very much for having me. This was very interesting. Thank you.